Hey everybody, Jeff here. No Jennifer right now. Sorry about that. I know she's the reason most of you come, but uh, I am here on your favorite occasional podcast, Pod of Thrones, to just introduce a special episode for you. Uh, I had the pleasure of sitting down with an author named Edward Savio. If that name sounds familiar, sounds familiar, great. Uh, if that name does not sound familiar, start by going back, look in your Pod of Thrones feed, try to rewind yourself to J- July 22nd, 2019. I was at San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, Jennifer was there too, but not for this interview. And I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Savio, uh, to talk about the upcoming release of his second book in this particular series called the battle for forever. Uh, leading into that interview, I was able to get through about half of his first book, which is called Alexander X. And I was already pretty excited for it, but nowhere near as much as I, uh, came to be. Because the first book was fantastic, uh, the second book was fantastic, uh, and now the third book just came out. So, as part of his uh, release of the third book, which is called League of Ald, A-U-L-D, he was nice enough to give me a really significant chunk of his time, and I'm very thankful for that. We got to talk about him, where he came from, why he writes what he writes, uh, and of course, how this particular series, The Battle for Forever, uh, came to be, and we tried to keep it non-spoiler uh, as much as possible, just talking about the broader concepts, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there's also a video version if you want a rare Jeff uh, screen appearance. Uh, there's a version on YouTube. I will post a link to that in the notes for this audio episode, and I think that's about it for now. Uh, make sure you check these books out, whether you read them uh, in physical form or the audiobook. They're all great. Um, I own both, honestly. Um, but yes, Alexander X and then Ancients Among Us, book two, League of Ald, book three just came out. I don't know if there's a book four coming because I don't know how book three ends yet, uh, but I'm going to find out soon. Uh, I think that's enough of me blabbing. So here comes the audio interview. Check out the video version on YouTube if you like. Either way, enjoy and get in touch with me anytime. Tell me what you think. Savio, welcome, not just welcome, but welcome back to Pod of Thrones. Thank you for joining me today. Thank Uh, you, Jeff. For those new here or just to jog memories of our longtime listeners, we met you, I met you, uh, Jennifer, my partner in podcasting crime is not here right now, Uh, but we met about three and a half years ago at a San Diego Comic-Con uh, outside the Hilton or Hyatt, I believe one of those hotels. We, we were definitely in one of those places. Definitely. It was, uh, (laughs) uh, and we had, we had a great talk, um, outdoors, uh, might've been a little windier podcast than I normally put out, but it was a fun conversation. And I had just started in on your content. Uh, someone was nice enough to set the interview up and share, uh, the audio, book version of alexander x um and i was about halfway maybe 60 percent the way through it so i didn't know everything that was coming and this was leading into the release of book number two right. uh, ancients among us so uh since then i've become a big fan finished book one devoured book two multiple times annoyed me for book three like, i literally uh, yeah. literally people you know uh, <laughs> one of the people that is instrumental for you having this is just all those people who kind of every once in a while went, what are you doing? Where's book three? Where's book three? Where's book three? Where's book three? So, yeah, so, you know, I, I might throw a Twitter poke every once in a while. 
And you were very polite about it. I tried. And it's I done. <laughs> no, no, I would never do that. No, you I would don't never presume do that. that you owe me anything. I just really wanted to hear what was going on. And I do. Okay, so let's let's start. I want to learn a little bit more about you. So okay. um, have you always been a writer? You grew up on the East Coast, right? And now you're in California. I did. I, so I want to hear about bi- your journey. I'm, I'm bi-coastal. I go back and forth. I uh, So I grew up. I grew up back East. I wanted to be a, uh, actually, I wanted to be a director. So I'm actually a failure. Um, I wanted to be a director when I was about eighth, seventh grade, seventh okay. grade. And I created a television series uh, about kids like in high school, junior high school, um, about life as it really is. And it was the kind of stuff that you might see on premium TV now, just really true to form, not sanitized, not for public consumption on a, on a broadcast station, but what really went down. So I wanted, that's how I, I wanted, I I started, I started writing that kind of stuff. And, um, and I realized there's a couple of ways to get into being a director. You can be, uh, you can be a a cinematographer, a cameraman, you know, Mm -hmm. the visuals, or you can come through writing. I mean, also directors also come from actors as well, but that wasn't going to be a path for me. And it's usually writers, uh, filmmakers, uh, and, you know, so there's people that are visual or the people that come from the words in the story. And I came from the story. And so I started writing. Uh, I went to, I went to Europe in, uh, just between my sophomore and junior year, uh, over the summer and just kind of like fell in love with French girls and came back. And my junior year in high school was not good because I, my head was just somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> and so in order to, to, to graduate high school, you know, my last year was, uh, just a crazy, crazy thing where everyone else was coasting with four credits or five and doing all this stuff. I had, we only had seven classes. I had full boat seven classes, took two uh, college courses at night during the year and wrote a musical as an independent study uh, for that, which we, which we put on. And, and so I went to school, Uh, you know, I wanted to be a writer. So I came out to California in Los Angeles and uh, you know, I was the 10 year overnight success. Um, I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote wrote a lot of scripts and got a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And when you're in your twenties and the eighties, you could live, you know, for not that much money uh, with three roommates or whatever. And uh, you know, I I made money rewriting other people's stuff or getting options for my own. And then finally, um, finally had some big sales with the studios. Uh, Swiss Family Rubenstein with Disney, hmm. Bookum with Sony. Uh, this my first novel, Idiots in the Machine, which I wrote as an anti screenplay because I had written at that point probably about eighteen or twenty screenplays, and I was like, screenplays are very constraining, um, and I just wanted to free myself. And I wrote this thing that I thought no one could ever possibly make into a movie. And um, Wendy Feinerman, who's the Academy Award winning uh, producer of Forrest Gump, uh, Sony uh, and Wendy Feinerman bought it. And uh, it was a lot of fun to develop. Uh, I may have been correct. It was not made into a movie. Like (laughs) I was going to ask if it came out as a different name, because I don't remember hearing about a movie called the it's in machine, but you you know, especially in the, especially in the, in the 80, in in the nineties and two thousands, uh, I made a very good living, absolutely never getting anything on screen. And that was something that, I mean, this, the idiots in the machine was a seven figure deal, you know? And so, um, Yeah. It, it so there was a lot of money being spent on product that for one reason or another talent couldn't you know wasn't available or the regimes would change and they want, wanted to go in a different direction but they always would have about and at the time it probably was down to one out of every six things got made uh i think before then it probably was even uh more it was in the 70s it was probably one to eight 
Um, you know, in the, in the studio era back in the thirties and forties, it was kind of like you wrote it, you made it, you didn't give a damn. I mean, you just put something on film. Once the studio uh, system broke down and actors and writers and directors became more powerful, uh, they made deals to make sure other people didn't get your stuff. Um, <laughs> oh, I lost you. You're muted. Oops, sorry. Am I back okay. again? There you go. Yep, you are. So it was a lot of fun to do that. And, and I made a, a great living at it. Uh, but I started to have kids moved up to San Francisco, um, and realized like, I didn't, I, I would, I spend almost half my time in Los Angeles going back and forth. And, um, I really, I couldn't do that once I had kids. And so I just started realizing I could go down for meetings, things like that. But I started really moving into this idea of, I wrote that one book, you know, it was, it was something I really enjoyed mm -hmm. and let me sort of dive into that, you know, after sort of, I spent a, several years kind of really focusing on my kids. I, I went back into that and decided, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to write novels because you know what? I could be a director in my novels. I'm the director. I'm the writer. You know? and, <laughs> and, yeah. And I, so I, yeah. I, I read this. I mean, learning more about you, this is really interesting because going through your books uh they feel very cinematic it's not a screenplay that you're reading but you can feel your direction like it's i can see a lot going on in my head as if it was a movie i've been you know i people have asked me a question like you know process and all that and for me i see and i'm sure other writers do as well uh but i see the thing like a movie i see it in my head i'm often outside looking in but with books you also have that internal um dialogue and so my process my journey uh as a as a person who was from the visual medium to this prose is that i see things visually but i want to write them and export them poetically and so um i used to be pretty sparse in my not not in books but I, in in my stage directions in screenplays i used to be like every like most writers you know i followed the rules and was like you know he opens the door she kisses him on the cheek blah 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 blah, blah. there's emotion there, oh they look into each other's eyes da, da, da. that kind of thing my screenplays now a lot more uh a lot more depth to them mm -hmm. a lot more you know, I'm writing for the people reading so that they can see it. Uh, it never will. Those words will never get onto screen. The dialogue will, the visuals will. And I also always think that, you know, the relationship between me and a reader is that I'm the writer and something of the director, but they're the director. They see, they direct the movie in their head. And when you do things with an audiobook narrator right you then are working with an actor which i'm i've always been very used to so i wasn't afraid of hearing people say my words in ways that maybe i didn't think of them because i've heard that a thousand times before and so there's me and then there's the interpretation by the actor performing the work and then there's the the listener um you know kind of coming in but um but it's really important to, you know, it's each of those things, the books stand on their own if you read them, mm -hmm. but they're also like so amazing in a completely different, not completely different, but in a new and an enhanced way when you listen to the audiobooks. So, yeah, I, that's a topic that I, you, you hear a lot of different opinions from a lot of different people about the world of audiobooks and i love them i've loved i've been into audiobooks since um oh god it must have been 2001 when i moved to california from wisconsin i drove for four days and i needed some entertainment so i i sort of some of most of a lot of audiobooks uh, uh, several of, by the way several of my best friends uh are from the midwest or from wisconsin green yeah. bay area or ohio we're good people and, and they came out to california it's like thank god they did <laughs> They really, they really, they really upped it. 
They really up. <laughs> we are making California a better place. That's that is absolutely yes, correct. One one Midwestern at a time. But then when you live in California, at least for most of us, there's a commute and that can be hellish at times. And podcasts and audiobooks have really gotten me through. But then yep. some people will say, well, if you read the audiobooks aren't really reading. Uh, you know, it's not the same, but you seem really very fond of your audiobooks. Uh I do. I mean, I, I am a fan of my audiobooks because they're different than my own writing. Like I read my writing in a critical way. It, you know, I go through and I I try to fix it and and rewrite and do that as much as possible. Um, when it finally gets out of my hand and it's in uh, you know, the hands of the the narrator, it, it becomes a different product. I uh I actually have I have had on all of these books, uh, I've gotten them back even after they've gone through all the production and all that. And I go through and I, I, because I'm a a person with technical skill and a, you know, a filmmaker, I guess I would call myself to a certain extent. I go through and do a pacing edit, you know, nothing big, but there's moments and and where, you know, it's just like, you know, there's needs to be more of a pause or sometimes a little bit less than, um, but in general, the performances, it's the same thing. Like people do with editing actors in a movie, like they might yeah. cut away from the scene real quick, or they might focus in on a close up rather than a, a medium shot. Um, but these, but, but first will and now, and now Ray, these actors have delivered things that I could not I could not have imagined uh, was in was in the text. You know, I, I would only hope it was in the text, and I would hope that people would get it. But there's even some things that are that are kind of beautiful, that um, and surprising to me. And so, I'm a fan of these books, as if someone else wrote them. And I know that might sound weird and kind of like uh, self indulgent, but it's really about their performance. It's, it's really about their skills as actors bringing something that I can't bring to it. That is what makes it amazing. And mm-hmm. having said that, right. It's also a, a, a narrator that doesn't quite work can make a great book. Not, not feel as good. I've read some classics that later on kind of just the same way that you said, Oh, I'm doing work or I'm working out and I, or I'm driving and I want to hear something, um, have narrators and it's not really the narrator's fault. Some, sometimes it's just, you know, you can't just slap a, a narrator onto every book. You've got to be intentional, you know? Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. You know? There are some audiobooks I've listened to that just fiction or nonfiction that just didn't yep. quite hit, but your stuff hits in a big way. Um, uh, and I think that's partially your writing style. And also you got some great talent. The first two books were, were uh, read by Will Wheaton. Yep. Um, that seems like a big get. I don't know. Uh, it is. Was... And I'm grateful for Will for joining us on those, you know, and um, you know, or I was sorry when he, he didn't, wasn't able to, didn't want to continue. Right. But as soon yeah. as I found out, like, I think he kind of made that, that decision a little bit earlier than we did. We knew, but as soon as I knew, um, yeah that he was going to be working on a lot of other stuff and his, you know, right. Uh, the first thought, the first thought was, uh, Ray Porter, Ray Porter. Oh, he was, your, and, did you, you, you had him specifically in mind. I had him specifically in mind as, as soon as I realized that, um, because, because there's a, there's, there needs to be gravitas. Like you can't, you can't have someone with the kind of talent that w- will is a very singular talent in terms of, and, you know, narrators and, there's only a couple of people. Uh, Ray is uh, Ray and Will are my two favorite narrators. There's a couple of other people, um, you know, one or two female narrators. Uh, R.C. Bray. If I was blowing shit up in space, I think you know R.C. Bray would be great. I love R.C. Right? You know, because um, he's just so good. Ah, rah, rah, rah. You know, he's so good at at that kind of uh, of stuff. He just brings something that no one else brings. When he came on the scene, it was like wow. Uh, but Ray. Ray Porter is the guy who is in my, in, he's in my audible uh, library the most of any person of any narrator. He is in there way before he ever came on board uh, with this. Ray has Amazing. been, yeah, Ray, Ray, you know, from the time Ray did the four hour work week, 
in the late, you know, two thousands. Uh, I don't know when it was exactly, you know, he, he, I was like, who is this person? And, huh. you know, his work with Peter Kleins and his work with uh, Jonathan Mayberry and his work uh, with, with project Hail Mary and with the, you know, we are Bob series. I mean, we are Bob, we are Legion. He just, you know, both, you know, both he, both he and Dennis, the, the author, I mean, they just created this an amazing work that uh, is, is really so much, so incredibly a, a symbiotic relationship between the two of them. And so I was very, very, very glad when we were able to get Ray and uh, because of getting Ray, because there was going to be a time gap, it actually allowed me to go in and do something I don't always get to do, which is once the once the book was locked, I got to unlock it and add about another 10,000 words and oh. do something to the there. The, it wasn't that the original ending of this third book was wrong. It wasn't as right as the ending is currently. And hmm. I was able to have a month to see that and two weeks before we were going into the studio i had an epiphany and just went crazy and and um and realized that i had i had not i had not fully delivered the promise of the premise and i went back and delivered the promise of the premise Okay, so let's talk about the premise. Uh, you're officially, I, I think, as of the time we're recording this, your book officially came out, I think, three days ago. Uh, yep. I got the audio book a few days before that because Audible, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but I, and then I was torn and I even wrote you about that. I'm like, should I listen to it now? I could just plow right through the audio book, but then. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Like, I think I might yep. want to talk to you first and let's talk about the premise. And and so I've just dipped a toe into the new book. Um, but I also went back and re-listened to the first two books. So where did the premise come from for Alexander X? Let's, let's talk about that for people that are new coming in new. So the prom the premise came from, uh, there was this story of, there was this idea that I had for a screenplay. Uh, called uh, the oh, uh, I'm gonna blank on the name of the damn screenplay right now, but um, it was uh, I'll remember. <laughs> anyway, it's just I it's, forgive you. Hey, thank you. Um, but it was basically about this character who lived for 200 years, and there were two offshoots of this idea and it was and, and this person kind of was they lived for about 200 years they looked like they were about 30 and they just were really good at a lot of different things mm -hmm. and they had no idea why they were good um it kind of then dovetailed into this other idea that i had which was um what if someone lost their uh amygdala like what if they burned it out there are there are people who have burned out their amygdala and they have no fear. They have zero, like, you know, some of these guys like who climb free climb cliffs, yeah. they have tiny amygdalas. They really, they're just, they're, they're minuscule. <laughs> they don't feel the fear like normal people do. And I thought, what would that person do? Like if they just, they were a fearful person, it got burned out because of an incident. How would they change? And these two things kind of came together and said, well, that other idea I still like about person who's fearless. But I thought, well, if 200 years is interesting, what if they were like 2000 years old? And I don't love, I mean, I like superhero movies, but I, I also find myself when I'm watching a superhero movie, if two people are fighting who are immortal, I'm like, well, well there's not really any stakes here. They're kind of beating the crap out of each other and nothing happens, right? Yeah. They're just like doing violence to each other and, oh, they're destroying buildings. But for them, you know, and innocent people, I always think, who's the guy in that third floor that's getting hit 
by, you know, <laughs> the Hulk throwing a guy in there. We're all like, yay, he threw the guy in there. And it's like, well, wait, hold on, hold on. Some kid is watching, you know, cartoons, you know, in that building. Um, and that's how I see the world too, right? That comic twist on things. Like what, what's the, what's the thing that's behind the Totally thing? get it. Yep. And so I thought, well, what if they were older and they had a lot of skills or they could learn a lot of skills? They weren't necessarily geniuses. Like they weren't the Da Vinci's of the world, but they just were very, 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 very good at mastering things. Mm -hmm. And they could die. So they were mortal. So mm -hmm. they had that fear in them and they had that uh, limitation on them. And then what would happen if we follow this one character who's 1500 years old, who looks like he's maybe 17 and he's, been doing this for a while and what if those other people the people that are four thousand years old five thousand years old who have been kings and queens and generals and controlled large swaths of swaths of the of the entire planet could no longer be famous anymore they couldn't do what they've done for thousands and thousands of years they had to stop to them it's like a hunt it's a year and a half right to them the last 150 years is like feels like a year and a half right but they have for a year and a half, they've been locked down in quarantine. And, you know, this happened before the quarantine, of course, but I think we all know how we felt when we were locked down. We didn't yeah. like it. And so uh, what would happen if those people decided the only way to fix their problem was to take out the modern world, to figure out what how to destroy 150 years worth of progress, or at least the 150 years worth of progress that could identify them easily and make them not be able to be who they want to be. We live in That's a world full of saying. cameras right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a world full of cameras. It's hard to be anonymous anymore. It's, or even without the cameras, just the way we're all tracked, everything we do, the fact that I can have a conversation with someone and then it shows up on my like suit, like an article about something I said with my mouth in a room shows up on my suggested searches or, or, uh, or suggested articles later. Like we're all being watched all the time. And these guys yeah. have had enough. They've had enough. And, and, you know, it's, it's DNA, it's fingerprints. It's uh, right. like you said, right. photographs. It's, it's just the collective memory that we all have now that we didn't have before. I mean, you know, I think it, it's one of the problems or one of the more interesting problems screenwriters have with writing heist movies these days. Um, it was much easier to write a heist movie in the 50s. You know, <laughs> I mean, you just drilled through, a, you know, the front of a, a of a safe. You blew up maybe a wall or you dug a tunnel and you were fine. No one was the wiser. There's all kinds of shit you got to get through today. And even like if you look at... um even if you look at Die Hard, which was, you know, future forward looking like nobody had that kind of security back then. That security in some ways doesn't even exist. But even then, there's security now that tops that 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 fictional futuristic view of 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 security. And so it's a tough thing to write a heist movie uh, these days because of that. And so uh, I wanted to take that premise, that idea and sort of use it to say a few things about how we as humans live and how we, you know, you are what you do every day. And if you do something every day, you're going to get good at it. And, you know, that instead of worrying about that, we don't live so long because we all want to live longer, happier and healthier, but doing the things that you want to do now rather than waiting tomorrow or next week or next year is kind of what I wanted to say with this. This was a, this was a love letter in some ways to my kids at the time um, that, you know, when I first started, I'm like, you can do anything you want to do. You just have to focus on it and you have to take the time. A lot. So I know when we first talked and I wasn't all the way through your book and I didn't exactly know what the bad guys were up to. And there was, there was plenty. I didn't know. We had these characters that were yep. nearly immortal in some ways, although certainly still as fragile as a human, but, uh, but could live almost forever. Yep. 
Um, Essentially, right? And I made a comparison to Highlander, yes. which was a, a movie series of my formative years. Uh, and it's only similar in that um, they, ha- they have very long lifespans and some rules about yep, what they can rules. or can't do. But and then also flashbacks. So the yes. high like the Highlander movies had a few flashbacks. The Highlander series was really where I just dove deep for many, many years. And like lots of every episode was like recalling some incident from two, three hundred years ago. And and uh, yep. and you do some of that as well. But your stuff seems very firmly rooted in history. It's not just uh here's a silly thing that happened at a tea party when I met another immortal. You have a lot of interactions with historical events, uh, which makes sense because many of these ancient characters were helping form those, help, helping right. form the world, were in charge or working very hard right. behind the scenes. Were, are you a historian by nature? Was this like a passion project in that regard? Because you just did you already know a lot of this stuff and you just wanted to bring some of these stories to light? Some of this, some of this I knew. So Jeff, it's part of the thing is that I'm not a historian, but I'm fascinated by history. Okay. And I'm also fascinated by, by not just history, but how history is manipulated, manipulated by, by everyone. Yeah. And it's used, it's used as a weapon. Um, there are stories that are told about history that are not just not really fully true. And it's hard to tell like because everything's been so re- rewritten, it's like a, a record that's been scratched a number of times, like back and forth and back and forth. Um, you kind of can dig deep and see what might be there, but it's hard. And um, one of the things for me was to go back and look at some things that uh, I found, which were surprising to me that I didn't know, or things along the way that I'd learned that went you know, this is weird that this is the truth. Like July 2nd, July 4th is really July 2nd. You know, the guy who, you know, the Wright brothers weren't the first person to fly a plane, you know? Right. Okay. Wait, wait, stop yeah. right there. Cause that was one where I was like, what a strange story this is. And you were, I can't remember his first name. It was Whitehead was the guy's name. Gustav and Whitehead. Gustav, Gustav Whitehead. Whitehead. And I'm like, I don't know where he's getting this stuff, but I, I Googled it. I was like, what if, and it turns <laughs> out there was a guy that was doing flight before the Wright brothers before and, the Wright brothers and a lot longer and better. And, <laughs> right. And that's amazing. Like, like how, why have I never heard of this guy? And you kind of tell a sad story in that regard. Um, I haven't fact checked all of everything you cite in your books by any means, but I've, I've looked up a few things here and there. I'm like, wow, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. And you, you're, you're hitting me with a lot Hold of on really a second, Jeff, stuff. I'm losing this thing here. What do you, oh, you're losing your, uh, I have lost our mic. <laughs> I can still hear. I you. may just go. I don't know. I may just go live here and see. Uh, you still sound fine. Uh, ooh, ooh. How does this sound? Is this Sounds okay great. still? Yeah. If you're talking, it's okay. I can hear you just fine. Okay, so let's go back to. So I missed the last. I missed the last couple of seconds of your question. <laughs> um, oh, I was just saying, like you know, I, I you you've. <laughs> um, I haven't looked up everything that you've cited in the books, but I have occasionally been like, well, Gustav Whitehead or or Peter Minuit. Uh, some of these things that you wind up mentioning in your books, and it just. I mean, you're teaching me some fascinating stuff, I guess, and uh, I just. Was that always part of your idea for when you started writing these books and, and how much time do you spend researching this stuff? So I spent a lot of time researching some of the things, uh, what, what was important to me, like, again, since this was really kind of a, like I said, a love letter to my, to my teenagers, uh, at the time, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to, to say, Hey, I, I've had this relationship with education where, uh, Education is a great thing. It's wonderful. I ended up learning many, many more things outside of the world of the school because I was curious. So you have to be curious when you're in school. You can't just, you know, if it's just about regurgitating facts, it's not going to be great. And so my thing has always been, hey, here's some facts that you may learn. And there's the dogs. Uh, Here's some facts that you may learn. And maybe someone told you this. 
but this isn't exactly true. So look a little bit deeper. So all of those things are based. Uh, in fact, I try to be as factual about everything. Um, there's a, a there's a part you probably haven't gotten to it yet in the third book where I have mentioned Halifax like three or four times. Don't spoil it and go look it up beforehand. But <laughs> Yes. You know, I have mentioned it and someone, mm-hmm. you know, a, a fan actually contacted me and, and was like, for the love of like, seriously, are you ever going to talk about what the Halifax incident means? <laughs> and I was like, it's coming. It's coming in this book. And yeah. And so I've tried to really make even when there's things that aren't like changing how we look at history, it's highlighting things that maybe we didn't know very much about. And it's putting these characters in there. One of the most fantastic things I love is I love time travel stories. I'm also one of those people Mm. that hate time travel stories because I am always like, come on, he can't do that. Right. That just screws up. I get frustrated at times. Every once in a while, someone does it right. But yeah, everyone (laughs) does it a little bit right. But this was my way, Jeff, of doing a time travel story without time travel. Good so point. Yes. Go okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> and as well, a matter of fact, go ahead. <laughs> well, you're not changing history in these books. You're just no. sort of adding some fictional parts to who the characters were that were there. But, but yeah, the, the but events also, themselves still play off. They uh, still play off, right? Yeah. But I'm also putting these people that we know in today's society, mm-hmm. like going back and rethinking what they thought about that moment where, so they have a modern view of like the, the event, Mm -hmm. right. They can look at something and, and know what happened in the intervening hundred or 200 or 300 years. And so like, like a time traveler, they might look at something, you know, I think one of the, I think when time travel is done best is when you take an incident that looks like it's a negative or a positive in the past. And then the person from the future going there, uh, realizes that positive is actually negative or that negative is actually positive and, you know, either works to save it or to change it or whatever it is. But, but, um, you know, I'm always of the belief, like one of the shows, do you remember, um, what was that show on NBC? There was like timescape or it was something like that. It was a time travel. They would go back and they quantum would change. Leap. No, not quantum leap. No. I thought quantum leap was good. I think quantum leap is cool. Cause it doesn't really, I mean, it kind of changes time, but it's not the same, but no. um, it would go back and it would change history. This show all the time, like the Hindenburg did major blow events, up. Yeah. major okay. events, yeah, Hindenburg didn't blow up, right. And, and I used to just get frustrated because I was like, no, you gotta, you gotta fail. Like time travel is best when it fails. It really is best when it fails. When you try your best to change history and the same thing happens because that's what, what was meant to be. That's when time travel is cool. Hmm. Um, and and it's a lesson to us that like we can change certain things about the world but we can't change everything about the world and we can yeah. only do the we can only fo- we should only focus on the things we can change i like that it's a good message um alongside the history stuff this is something that i just kept thinking about again and again you have uh so there's plenty of action scenes in these books uh Eternals get into fights with each other or other forces. Couple, there, yeah. There's there's chase scenes. There's fight scenes. There's also uh, explosions, uh, yeah. gunplay. It's all extremely detailed. Uh, again, paints a very vivid picture in my head as I'm reading or listening to it. Uh, in the same way, I'm wondering if you're a historian, like, have you studied a lot of this stuff, or is this just a lifetime of watching <laughs> action movies? Or uh, you know, where does the research come in for it's, your? It's, it's living living action movies. Um, uh, so there was a very funny thing. Someone asked me a question and I'm actually going to do a, a video about this, about, about some of the writing process. Right. So I'm, I'm starting my mark, my marketing people have always said, Hey, listen, start talking about your process. Cause your process is kind of weird. Like, I mean, every writer has their own thing, but I have some weird stuff that goes on. Like okay. my, you know, I, I walk around doing some scenes. So I, I write three different ways. I write like everybody writes like, you know, you know, screenplays and books now on a typewriter. Sure. You know, I, I do it old school. I also write on digital pads where I'm writing notes and also redlining PDFs of current, you know, first drafts or second or third or fifth or 10th drafts (laughs) of, of something where I'm handwriting non-destructive editing, which is really important for writers. Like you got to learn how to do non-destructive editing where you're, 
literally redlining over the top of stuff that exists because you can do anything then. You could make any kind of change. And then later on, you might not put it in. But yep. when you put it into the document, when you're typing, it changes it. And yeah, you can hit undo, but you can't really make a judgment on it. Like when you look at it from a thousand, you know, like looking at it from 10,000 feet. Absolutely. And the other way that I write, it's never final. You know, Sidney Sheldon and all these other guys used to literally dictate stuff and their assistants would <laughs> transcribe it. Yeah. But I use voice recognition. And so I have my Beyonce mic and I walk around with my Beyonce oh, mic uh -huh. and my, and my, and my audio pack that's hooked to my computer. That's usually like, I got a big giant 65 inch screen is one of the screens and it's like 20 feet away from me and I'm walking around pacing and I'm doing the action sometimes where I'm like going up against the wall with a gun or I'm limping and I'm describing what I'm feeling and seeing like, what is the, my character thinking and my neighbors, those who can see in my windows must think I'm an absolute crazy person. Because I'm talking to myself, and I'm shadow boxing and fighting with myself uh, in the middle of a room. And, and so, so not always. So some of those moments are at least influenced by that kind of me walking around with a digital recorder or doing it, you know, live into the dictation um, where I'm just actually working out the moment and the the hardest thing to do is to write an action sequence because good dialogue is easy for me i'm a screenwriter i love dialogue um you know kind of wordplay is fun and interesting and playing on sentence structure is fun um i really get into that i like digging my teeth into the language of stuff but writing an action uh sequence in a movie, you can take three seconds on a screen or two seconds or a half a second to, to describe or to see or to show a close up of something and give the audience a piece of information that you can't do eloquently in a book. And so I went and I was like, who are the best that ever have done this? And I would have to say that the best that ever did it was Alex Alexander Jamal. And so, oh. mm -hmm. so Count of Monte Cristo. Three Musketeers and, and the sequels to Three Musketeers. Like you read those books and that's the best action description because you're not telling the action always. It may feel like you're seeing every move, but what you're actually telling is the feeling of what you're feeling while that action is happening, while the, uh, your, your reaction to the action is what you're actually describing. So um, because it would get really boring. I think if you were just saying he hit him on the head and then he walked three <laughs> paces and turned around and swung this and people would be just like, Oh yeah. Wake me. Wake me. <laughs> right. Well, what catches me is like, you'll have the, the intricate details come in like leverage and the physics yep. behind some of the things that happen to people. And just because I am a lifelong, let's just say enthusiast of like martial arts and stuff. Have, yep. have you studied anything yourself? Do you have any I have studied a little bit, but mostly it's me doing and, and talking to Just, people and saying and learning from how my, like, if I was in this situation, you know, I mean, there's a chapter in book one uh, called, uh, I'm not paranoid, I'm just well informed. And I'm not paranoid, I'm just well informed. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I don't, I don't sit there, I'm not a prepper, but man, I can make a battery out of uh, you know, a barrel and a bunch of chemicals if I needed to. Uh, one of the things that my kids always laugh at me is they're like, the FBI absolutely has a file on you because some of the, and I think, all oh, right, it's not, it's not unique to me. Uh, writers, the search patterns of writers would give the <laughs> NSA all kinds of trouble. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was once sitting in, uh, in the DC airport in Reagan national. And I was about to write the scene or I was, it was coming up in the time to write the scene in that takes place in Boston, Logan in the second book. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting walking. My, my youngest has just done 
uh, a trip to uh, to Washington D.C. You know, for you know those the things that those honored kids and come come and go and do and they learn about you know the process. So I'm picking him up, mm-hmm. and I'm in the airport, and in the gift shop they have. I, to this day, I still can't. This is not. This is not 1990. This is 2012, right? They have two, 2015 or whatever it was when I first started writing some of these ideas down. They have the Washington Monument. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. In the glass, in the plasticine Washington Monument, in the gift shop. This is a weapon. Mm-hmm. This is a tr- this is a stabbing weapon, and it's behind security. And, you know, I'm like, well, Boston has, you know, the, the Bunker Hill monument, which would be similar. So I don't know, like I've been to Logan, but I didn't go look for the, for that, but I was like, well, it, it exists now. It's in, (laughs) if it's in the Washington airport, it's in the Boston airport and I'm going to use it. And so, um, and the other thing that you just mentioned, which was really important is it's about pacing. There is, I've read, I've read technical people who just write that, all that cool, I'm going to write everything about the, the physics of a fight and how the physics of a fight works. But it's also kind of the meter, uh, when, by the way, writers, if you're listening to this every single time that the, the grammar checker. Like you need to have your own style. Like don't listen to the damn grammar checker because the grammar checker often tells me you have too many short sentences in a row here. Right. And I have huge long sentences and it'll also tell me I have that too. Yeah. The idea is that you have to break those up. Like when I'm telling you the fight, da, 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 da. Oh, by the way, here's this little tiny detail right here. I'm going to stop. I'm going to slow the action down and I'm going to elongate that for just a second. As I tell you this piece of trivia or this piece of physics. And then I'm going to boom, jump back in because if I stayed too long in there, it would make you, it would be boring. Right. And so there's people that can agree or disagree with whether or not I, I go too long or too short on that, you know, but those are my choices. And the people like you who have really responded to this, uh, I think we, we enjoy those things when writers take those moments and if that makes any sense to write it does to me yes yeah the pace i mean there's something in there right like you're you're not too detailed you don't spend too much time on the physics but there's something about that pacing um by the way i'm going to take when you give me this i'm going to take a clip of that of me doing da 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 and just post that because that will look, Oh yeah, that's going to look good. <laughs> <laughs> that's the conversation. Here's my writing. Have when, yes. That's here's my, here, yeah. Here's my, here's my writing advice. Here's my writing. You mentioned Boston Logan airport. You, the first book takes place entirely in, boston or the surrounding area you did a lot of damage to boston were you working out some issues um <laughs> you know it, it you know it, it's funny i mean i do not dislike boston i have boston it's funny i you know san francisco and boston uh, two of my favorite places uh i'm fans of the sports teams in in those uh, cities as well mm-hmm. um so but uh you know yeah, I mean, there was there was a, just a couple of things, uh, and I also am very very intentional about you know I don't like to just blow. Let's not just always blow up the Washington Monument and always blow up the White House. Um, but um, there were just some places that that just needed to go a little bit, and uh, and there were. I think it was also it was also uh, I think uh, without giving away any spoilers or anything what happens in the first book, the moment where there's an ex- first explosion in the book, it shows this. I don't think it's telling anything out of school, but it shows the lengths that people who live thousands of years go to make sure that they're not discovered, you know? 
Yes, indeed. And still some mysteries, at least as we go into book three, which I haven't only the first chapter, uh, still some mysteries about who is or is not around following explosions and chases and a bunch of things that happened during the first two books. Yep. Uh, uh, Paris, you weren't especially kind to Paris in the second book. <laughs> and another uh, of my favorite cities. I love Paris. It's a lovely so, city. <laughs> I, they're love letters with bombs is what they are. They're, they're, they're they're package bombs sent with a love letter you know is is what i would probably yeah, once I'm again, the your, Google, your google search history must be just a hellscape of explosives and uh, plane uh, hijackings and all sorts of stuff it's by the by the way also jeff like when like if you go in because i looked at some stuff and did a lot of research with i i get a lot of prepper news uh oh i bet not 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 because i want to but because i had to go and give my email or something to go get in and get some information. And uh, it's a fantastic world. I mean, as crazy as we may think some of these people are, I absolutely a hundred percent believe that my thousands year old characters would know all of this, all of this stuff and use it. Absolutely. Um, gosh, uh, I, I want to be mindful of your time, but I've got a couple questions. I still wanted to ask you. Um, sure. I, I think I've read your first two books f- four times now, I think I want to say over no. the last three years, uh, love them to pieces. One thing that uh, I can't decide if I love it or if I'm missing something or <clears throat> I don't know what, but I'm pretty sure that through those first two books, we have three main characters, uh, yep. Alexander and Phoebe and Daniel. Um, I, you never really describe them. Am I, am I wrong? Like they, I feel like I don't really know what they look like. No, you're not wrong. Was that, so that was a conscious choice. That is a conscious choice because of a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, you know, I think that judging people by the outside of who they are is, you know, we do that. I mean, I know that in certain books I'm going to, in my, Coming this summer, my not safe for work book, uh, Velvet Sledgehammer. It's an adult, um, very comic drama, high drama, um, highly comic book. Okay. Um, you know, it's been called vulgar and surprisingly poignant, right? right. By those who I mean, you've it. made your sale. Yep. So <laughs> it, it, it does kind of, it can go into yeah. the, it goes in deeper to the people, right? But I, I feel like this is my, this comes from, Perhaps this comes from my writing screenwriter background. Okay. My screenwriter background is that you don't tell what the actor looks like because you don't know who's going to read this, right? You have no idea. Now, if you're writing for a particular person, you can describe that, I guess. But in general, you need to tell what that person is, not what the, you know, and how they act and how they would be portrayed, but not what they look like because they could look like they could be a dark haired person. They could be a blonde. They could be anything. And I also feel like a lot of people um, have in their heads, these views of these characters. And then when you change anything, they, people freak out. Like if a movie gets made, you know, uh, or, you know, JK Rowling got a lot of shit for when, you know, she had um, an African American, a biracial person play uh, Hermione in a play in in london and it was like she said all i ever say is she has kinky hair right all i ever say yep she bushy haired and kinky that's all i ever said and um for me uh if you want to look at process and and again i'm gonna part of what i'm gonna be doing soon is kind of go through some of this process i have um i have care i have actors that I see or some that are known, some that are not known, but I have headshots of people. And sometimes there are amalgamations of two or three people um, that, you know, I'll have like two or three or four pictures up of a person in my character development that has all the traits of this person. So I have an idea of what they look like to a certain extent um, in my own head and how I see them. But my job is not to tell you how to see your life. So, you know, there was one review once that said, um, 
what no black people ever live in this world and i was like <laughs> there's like three people like it's uh, uh, like um you, you know phoebe amara if you want to know the truth if you want to get the is, is to me a person who would be very much like um you know the, the there's several actresses who are like this they're born in london they're you know they're half indian or uh you know half you, you know uh, Southeast Asian and African American or something or a mix. And that's what I see Phoebe as, you know, and it's like, and all these other characters, um, Renica, you know, people from the middle East and, and middle and, um, you know, the whole Mediterranean, all of these characters are Brown. None right. of these characters are white. Right. Alexander I mean, can't possibly be at least all Caucasian. We don't know that much about his mom, but his dad's, can't yeah i mean yeah. just age and location yeah just age and location so because you know one of the things that was interesting is that when i first when we were first talking about different things you know one of the rules of the world is that in general um the people speak whatever language they're speaking they speak relatively speaking without an accent and the reason is because they're just so good at it like if they're speaking to us in English, they're either talking with a British accent or an English or an American accent. Right. If they're speaking French. They sound like they're French, you know? Um, and so, you know, even along that, there's a little bit in, in the narration where you hear some accents and that's, those are great. And they're kind of in the book, but in general, um, these, these characters aren't, they aren't uh, whitewashed or singular. What they are is they are what they would be which is they're from a long time ago. They don't look like us. They are already a mix of that whole cradle of humanity, uh, a thing from the Mesopotamia and Africa and, you know, and the Mediterranean, those places were, and, you know, you know, Asia and all of that, where all these people came together and really formed who we are today. We're a lot different now. And so, um, so that's why I haven't described them because I think that telling you any of that in concrete ways in a book makes you make a decision about people, which um, should be part of the story, like of who they are and where they're from. I think that's great. Great explanation. Um, speaking of characters, there's a, I mean, he's definitely a villain. Uh, and I guess the Is book, he? perhaps the books have, Oh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, one of the bad people we run into is um, like a billionaire. He's yep. obsessed with immortality and youth, gets blood yep. transfusions from 18-year-olds, yes. <laughs> doesn't believe yes. in democracy. I'm just wondering, where did you come up with a – you live in the Bay Area. Um, where did you come up with an idea like yeah. that? It seems pretty far-fetched. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I definitely think that there is def there is an archetype. There is an archetype. Uh, certainly there are probably three to five people amalgamated amalgamated <laughs> into that, uh, you know, and weighted, you know, with one perhaps being about 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, I might have that person's you, name written you down might my notes. Guess, yeah. You might, you might have guessed some of that. Um, but again, it's about, you know, and some of the just, you know, you, this is again, where, where you go and you take reality and you, you kind of, you know, you can't make, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You really can't, <laughs> you, you can't make this stuff up. The, the things that some people say, and, you know, I went through and took liberties with, with quotes and, 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 uh, rephrased, you know, some real quotes, uh, -huh. uh it's, of uh real there are people. certain things that that character said that sounded awful familiar, awful familiar. And mm -hmm. you just can't make it up because, you know, it, it's, and, and, and to do so, right? Like people are like, oh, well, you know, that's not really fair. You're not, whatever you're, you're not really taking that into consideration. And I'm like, no, dude, you got to understand. These are real people. This is, this is about as real a story as one can get, except for this little device where these people age slower. That's the only thing that's in here that's sci-fi. You know, everything else is who we are and how we react to, to things and what would probably happen in certain cases, um, you know, yeah. I try not to, I don't, 
I, I like to watch fantasy sometimes. I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of it, but I tend to, I tend to enjoy writing um, a little bit more based in reality. Even if that's in the stars, even if I'm writing something that is fantastic, um, I try to keep it based in reality. I've got a new book that's going to come out uh, that I'm working on between book four, uh, not the, the adult mainstream, but another sci-fi book. And it kind of goes the opposite way where this, this has no magic. This has no, you know, weird things, but I found a device that allowed me to do almost anything I wanted. And I wanted to explore that a little bit, but it's still based on, um, it's still based on science rather than on just having a power. And, um, because I love, I love giving myself constraints. Like I, one of the hardest things was to write some of the scenes where I had no way out, uh, because I had no magic. I had no ability to do anything that was beyond the physical nature. And, um, there were moments where I'm like, how am I going to get out of this scene that I've painted myself into and cursed myself for not giving a character some little ability here and there? Hmm. I, I would like to end with one question that, um, to me, the answer seems super obvious, but I wind up hearing surprising answers from lots of other people. And it does tie into your books. Um, if you could, would you want immortality? There's a quote at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. It's by an actor in the twilight series and Alex Moraz. And basically he says, I would not want to be immortal forever. And, <laughs> and I think it's a great quote. And I think it's, uh, I think that I would, uh, I think all of us get, I don't know who has extra, the people who have existential angst out there, uh, understand this. I think the idea of not existing is weird. Um, I think the idea of that, we don't have any, you know, understanding of what is afterwards. It was funny. Like I read something yesterday or two days ago. That was a very, very short quote. And it was, you know, um, it was, you know, not, you know, they say nothing happens after you die. Actually, lots of stuff happens. You're just not part of it. Um, and that's annoying. <laughs> Certainly. But, but I think what this story has been for me is how do we come with, how do we come to our humanity and how do we come to understand that there aren't always answers for everything. And that in the end of this story, this story is driving to a, a finish that I've known for a long time. Um, and it won't, I could say it a million times and it won't, I don't think people will get it because it's just, it's, it's not a, it's not specific to an issue, but it just feels like I, I've always known where this goes and, um, our characters have to act in the way that they can and they should, they, they want to get out, but these characters uh, especially the older ones, you know, they don't live in our world. These characters, all of them actually right. have lived in a world that doesn't exist today. And they've lived it for 98% of their lives. And we are the immature ones. We're the ones that don't know how exactly to live in this way that we live today. We're just learning how to do it. But wouldn't it be, I mean, wouldn't it be so cool to just be able to see what's happening on earth a thousand years from now? I would love it. I think I would that, love I that would. too. I would love it. I think the weird part is if, have you read the, we are Bob series? I have not or listened to it. Mm -mm. You have it? No, oh, I can put it on my list. <laughs> it's definitely a, 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 definitely you should listen to it. Ray Write Porter it does right it. Now. He's amazing in it. And the premise is simple. It's not giving away anything because it comes in the first few minutes. Um, Bob is a guy who puts himself into 
he signs up so he can freeze his head. And, oh. you know, if he dies, uh, he's going to get woken up in the future mm-hmm. uh, when they can solve whatever killed him. And, you know, not long after he does, he, he dies and he wakes up like Im- immediately afterwards and it's 300 years in the future. And Oh, by the way, uh, a very religious group has decided that uh, it was against God and nature <laughs> to have this happen. And so uh, AIs are based off of these things and you, you can't, you can only be used as a slave in a way. And uh, this character is an engineer and is set out to control a, a a a ship that goes off and helps try to find um find resources and stuff for the for humanity and what the most interesting thing about it, it is the question is is bob uh cuz he's a copy okay to, you know even if he exists, like does me, the me that would be copied, right? Does the, I, do I know that I have the future, right? Hmm. That other Bob has a future, but I don't, but I don't know if I would remember because I'm not, I'm still something else. And each one of those other, uh, yeah. iterations. So, I mean, that's a different path to immortality. I think, I feel like that would at least take the sting off of death, even though you wouldn't actually yourself get to experience the future. That's right. <laughs> but but of course I would you know I would absolutely a hundred percent I mean I don't we all until very late think we we're going to live forever I mean I think that's <laughs> that's how I think we we live our lives most of us um, you know uh, and we always laugh at the people who go you know I have friends of mine who have been living for retirement for their entire lives like they've been practicing like and I'm like God that seems weird. <laughs> but I, but I, but I agree with your premise. I agree okay. with your premise, Jeff. I think <laughs> if I gave you my honest personal answer, of course, of course, I'd want to live for as long as I could. I think uh, it would, yeah. I think we would get a bit annoyed um, <laughs> with each other. I think, I think, I think like these characters here, yeah. I, I talked with my girlfriend about this and she's like, oh, I love you, man. But a thousand years of you. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, my that, girlfriend doesn't want that either. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm like, I would be like all over that a thousand years of that. That'd be great. And, but they know us though. They, you know, <laughs> we don't always know ourselves. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess maybe I should think about that some. Uh, all right. Last thing I'm going to say uh, is that uh, I said this three and a half years ago when I was like this much invested into what you were making. And yep. now it's like, cause I just, it blew up on me and I love it so much this should be a TV series. I feel like it, 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 it just, you could almost just film what you wrote. And I really hope that someone's listening because surely someone's listening. I'm well, listening. remember I'm a screenwriter first. And so, and I wasn't even thinking about that three and a half years ago, but now you're putting all these ideas in my head. <sighs> yeah. And we, we, you know, I have thought about how this would be, and we've developed actually how we could go forward and, you know, because I, I think that the story as it is, is really good. I think the story as a basis, but I also think that from the beginning of any television series or a movie or anything, I would want to see the other things that are going on in the background that we, we see a bit more as we come, you know, the, the, the story started out like this and it kind of grows and we start to see all of the things that we didn't see that were hidden and yeah. one of the cool things about people who have read this book a couple of times and the greatest compliment, by the way, that you can give me and you have given me and others have given me is that they have reread this book and that they have found it to be enjoyable the second or the third time oh, very because much. there are things in there that when you read the third book, it will make you go back and want to read or at least look at parts of the first and second book where you're like, wait, did he just dub- dovetail that together? And that's been some of my most fun things is to make this. I always knew where most of these things were going. Characters do surprise me at times, but um, there are places that we get to in the third book that if I was telling the story in a visual medium, I might want to see some of that, some of those characters, what they are doing 
in the background earlier. So I think it would be kind of a fun um, experience to take this to that next level. And well, um, when it yeah. happens, uh, yep. yeah, I'd love to come for a set visit and see how things you, are going. You would definitely yep. be invited. <laughs> definitely come. Oh, uh, well, I'm just going to keep crossing my fingers because uh, I love it. So I'm going to go uh, enjoy the third book now. Uh, you have been incredibly generous with your time. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how the story ends and if the opportunity arises someday, perhaps some kind of spoiler cast where we uh, just blow some of this stuff up and I ask you some of my deeper, deeper abiding questions about what happened. Yeah, well, we could do one where it just says, beep, 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 you know, where we just, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. How about beep? Oh, beep. When beep oh, came, boy. Beep, beep was terrible. No. Beep was terrible, but when beep beeped, oh. <laughs> It was beep and beep, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know that was what we'll do. We'll just do. We'll just do that, and people okay. will enjoy that just for the just for the, the sound in their ears that they hear for days. Uh, I'm going to look forward to that. Um, where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me at, at pretty much Edward Savio everywhere. So uh, Edward Savio at Edward Savio on Twitter, mm-hmm. Instagram. Um, if you look my name up. Uh, on Facebook, Facebook actually has a really, I mean, I always kind of diss, we all diss Facebook a little bit, but, uh, I think reason. I have some, what's that for good reason. Yeah. There's... For good reason. But I think I have some of the best interactions with fans there and, um, and I do interact with fans. So if you do like this stuff, um, you know, and even if you don't, and you want to talk to me about <laughs> it, um, I'm, I'm there. I'm not, uh, I'm available because I find it interesting and, um, you know, we have good conversations. I'm not going to tell you what happens. Um, but, but I will, you know, I do have conversations about things that are meaningful in the book and it's a lot of fun. So Edward Savio at all those places, edwardsavio.com. Um, if you go to edwardsavio.com and go just scroll down to the bottom and you give me your email, I do not email people about anything other than just giving you guys free, uh, things like a no- access to no- a free novella. Right. If you haven't read Bloodborne, Jeff, you should read the backslash Bloodborne. You've read the second book now, and you, the Renica character that gets introduced in the second book pretty great has character. her own story. Yeah, um, you know, and it's it's just a lot of it's just she's a different animal. She's great, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So you know, so you go there, you just put in your name, and you can get instant access to it, and also like you'll see other stuff. Amazing. Um, and your so, books are on Amazon. They're on Audible. Yeah, uh, in bookstores, you can get them. You know, ask for them if they're not there on the shelf. Yell at them if they don't have them on the shelf. Just yell. That's, I totally agree. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you again for your time, uh, Edward. I hope we talk to you again soon. I'm looking forward to this uh, third book and everything else to come. Velvet Sledgehammer, you said? Velvet, the Velvet Sledgehammer. The Velvet Sledgehammer. Yeah, uh, sort of a novel. You, you already sold me on it, so it's all good there. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a great rest of your day. Uh, And again, thank you for joining us on Pod of Thrones. Thanks, Jeff.